so welcome everyone to our town hall event today. Uh, this is the Disability Communities Day to bring legislative leaders together with members of our community um, for a virtual day on the Hill. A little bit different than what we're used to doing, but we are delighted to have everyone here today. And you know, we didn't have parking problems. There's, there's the upside. Um, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping as we get started this morning. Or, well, just afternoon, isn't it? Just after 12. Uh, we will have a sign language interpretation for the, this event, which I think you can see on your screen now. You can click, uh, right click or hover over the interpreter's video and pin it to your screen. And she will stay there and be visible no matter who's talking. Uh, we also have live captioning for this event. Um, if you click on the CC button um, down at the bottom, it should be their button down there. Um, it'll present captions in your Zoom window if you need them. So please um, do that. And then finally, just to let you know, um, we are going to be uh, recording this event and sharing the presentation and the PowerPoint in the weeks ahead. So um, you are able to share that with others if you need to. On our agenda today, just very quickly, we have six members of the General Assembly who are gonna be joining us one after another today. Uh, our first two are already here. Um, and we have one of their constituents in many cases who are going to um, engage them in discussion about legislation that they're sponsoring. We have asked for questions from the public in advance uh, because we only have an hour. We wanna respect everyone's time. We're probably not gonna take um, live questions, but if we have some time, uh, we will jump in with some of those questions that have been um, submitted ahead of time. Tight schedule, so here we go. Um, I, hope, I hope that um, from this event, you will gain some insight into the legislative session um, and some scoop about how things are progressing. We can hear about that from um, representatives Whitson and Jernigan perhaps. Um, and then to, then to close our event, we're gonna have a celebrity musical guest who's gonna sing us on our way so that we're kind of excited about that. I don't say so. <laughs> No, no, y'all don't have to sing. It's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll save that to the end. Anyway, to get us started, I am really honored um, to have Representative Sam Whitson and Representative Darren Jernigan with us, two very good friends of our community. Um, Representative Whitson was a prime sponsor of the Katie Beckett legislation in 2019. He represents District 65, which is part of Williamson County, um, a little bit of Davidson County. Uh, so glad to have him. Um, Rep Representative Jernigan, I can say that, um, yep. is from District 60, which is part of Davidson County up in sort of the Donaldson area. Um, both really great guys. So um, Representative Whitson, um, can you just describe for us a little bit the um, March 11th Disability Advocacy Day proclamation um, that you did for us? And we just greet our Constituents. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, thank you, Carol. And um, this is House Joint Resolution 188. Darren and I filed this. Uh, we're, 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 we signed on to it. And uh, it's not real long. Can I read it for you guys? Is that? Sure. Okay. Whereas there are approximately 1.6 million Tennesseans with disabilities, whereas a disability can present unique challenges in the day to day life of the person experiencing it. And whereas individuals with disability experience barriers to access to accessing the same education, housing, transportation, health care as their peers, and whereas individual advocacy can be a powerful tool for Tennesseans with disabilities to break down barriers to equality or to equity, excuse me, and whereas collective advocacy can and bring about great social and political change, such as the passage of the civil rights legislation the Americans with Disability Act and the Tennessee Disability Act. Whereas it is appropriate that we should honor the role of advocacy and improving the lives of Tennesseans with disabilities and the state of Tennessee. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives on the 112th General Assembly of the state of Tennessee, the Senate concurring that we commemorate March 11, 2021 as Disability Advocacy Day in Tennessee. Signed Cameron Sexton, Speaker of the House, and Representative Darren Jernigan and Representative Sam Whitson. Woohoo! Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. You know, we we talked about these things and we said, you know, we the disability community doesn't need an awareness day. People are pretty aware. What we need is an advocacy day, and and the, the fact that you two would would um, sponsor that and make that happen is just really important. Thank you for being really good friends um, to the disability community and to everyone in this state. I think that um, your leadership 
in the in the House um, makes a real difference. Your bipartisanship in the House, I think, makes a real difference. So, um, Representative Jernigan, Representative Whitson, thank you for being with us today. I'm going to move us ahead, unless you've got a few things you want to say. Uh, no, just if I can just say one thing about uh, you, you touched on it a little bit that you know Sam's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, but uh, if you have a disability, there's no there's no party to it. So, and you also said about advocacy, and when you have uh, people such as Sam, and 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 moving forward, it leadership it matters who sponsors bills, and it matters who stands up for a community, and I'm so proud that. To, to be with Sam and standing with him back to back when we try to to face these issues that face all people with disabilities in Tennessee. So well, I tell you, I was very blessed my first session up here to, uh, to be seated next to Darren on the House floor. And I knew right away what a great individual uh, and friend that he is. And um, and I tell you, I, I tell people this, and, and I'm very sincere. He has made me a better legislator and a better person. And uh, I, uh, uh, we have a great team and, uh, and we try to set the example up here that if you work together, you can do great things. But I just want to tell you, Carol, the group that worked on the Katie Beck, it was a team effort. Mm -hmm. and, and the advocacy that you, you and your team brought up here uh, ensured success. You are the arch architect of victory uh, yes. uh, on that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. it, it, it's, you know, last the, our theme last year was in this together. This year, it's go further, and it really does take all of us. So thank you, gentlemen. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I've, I've got Senator Watson in the wings, and so we're going to move right on. But thank you okay, for being you know, with us. We'll see you guys later. Okay. Right. Okay, no. Right. Thanks. So um, I am delighted um, to be able to introduce... Um, Senator Bo Watson, who's joining us today, and I also would like to introduce um, Sarah Scott, who is um, a wonderful advocate who works with us um, on the public policy team at the coalition, and she's also a part of our Family Voices of Tennessee program, um, and I'm going to let her um, introduce um, Senator Watson and um, a constituent, Kim LeFew, who will uh, be at the next part of our panel. Sarah. Good morning. So Senator Bo Watson is with us with District 11, which is part of Hamilton County. Um, he is on the following committees. He is chairman of the Finance, Ways and Means Committee and chairman of the Rules Committee. And he also is a member of the Commerce and Labor Committee, the Health and Welfare Committee, and the Joint Fiscal Review Committee. Kim LaFew is from Hickson, she is the mother of Lake and ha who has trisomy 12P. She is also the board chair of a nonprofit called Downside Up, an organization that encourages growth and inspires learning and develop connections for children of all abilities and their families. We're thrilled to have them both here. Well, okay. thank you for having me, Senator Watson. Uh, I live in the Hickson area and uh, Many of your uh, folks may not realize I'm a physical therapist by training and work at Park Ridge Medical Center in Chattanooga when I'm not playing uh, the Senate role. That is awesome. It's good to see you today. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, well, and like, well, I, I haven't seen a lot of people in a while. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I'm so glad you joined us today. And um, my first question for you, Senator Watson, is, Many people with disabilities, we go through times where we experience significant health care costs, and um, it's, it's, it's costly to stay healthy, especially for children and, and adults with special needs um, and disabilities, and we can't always choose who's involved with our care. So when we experience, um, you know, we have an out-of-network physician, we're in a hospital setting, and then all of a sudden you get this surprise medical bill for the balance that wasn't paid by the insurance. Uh, it can be thousands of dollars. Can you tell us about how your balance billing leg legislation, excuse me, SB1 would seek to change this? Well, thanks for asking, uh, Kim, about the bill. I've been working on it for about eight years now. Um, obviously, I'm a, as a health care provider, I'm a strong believer that, you know, patients should be not be held responsible for decisions that are made 
outside of their uh, understanding. And as you've alluded to, frequently patients uh, unknowingly are treated by uh, caregivers that are outside of their network. And when those things happen at no fault of the patient, then uh, you know fundamentally, I don't believe the patient should be held responsible. So eight years ago, we started working on this legislation, which would basically hold the patient harmless. Fortunately, uh, the United States uh, Senate and the United States House of Representatives passed a balance bill uh, back in December, uh, which applies uh, in Tennessee and all across the country. I have another bill uh, up in the Tennessee Senate, which is a little bit what I believe better than the, uh, the US Congress version. Again, holds the patient harmless, uh, but it seeks to make sure that providers who take care of patients get paid appropriately by their, their insurance companies and allows for a negotiation to occur outside of the patient's uh, responsibilities. Patients are held harmless in both bills. That's awesome to hear. Um, has there been any opposition to this bill? I'm well, sure the insurance industry has concerns about it. They're afraid that uh, it might result in the escalation of healthcare costs for individuals. Uh, with the passage of the, the act in Congress, that sort of negates that argument. Now the argument is, well, we have a federal solution, so there's really no reason for the state to have their own solution. However, there are insurance plans that are not covered by the federal legislation that would be covered by my legislation. So I think it's uh, up here, we call it using a belt and suspenders, where we have two pieces of legislation that provide for maximum protection uh, for patients and their families. That's awesome. Um, what are, what are ne next steps for it and how can those of us um, in the community help to support this? Well, I think in the community you talk positively about uh, balance billing uh, as a state solution. Uh, its next stop is the uh, Senate Commerce and Insurance Committee. Um, I presented it last year to the Commerce and Insurance Committee and didn't have the votes to get it out of the committee. Um, this year, we'll see. Uh, but uh, I would encourage your membership to uh, take a look at the Tennessee uh, Senate website, find out who the committee members are on the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee, and have people from those areas of the state where those individuals live reach out to them and encourage them to support balanced billing. Awesome. That is great. Well, um, th thank you so much for that. But I do want to move ahead, Senator Watson, to the next one that really, really is near and dear to my heart. And that is the bill SB 602 that you have sponsored to install height adjustable adult size changing tables in new and renovated public buildings. That, yeah, yeah. That's amazing because for us within our family, um, Lake was not potty trained until, well, until COVID. I, I will say that that's been the best thing that has come out of the pandemic is being home. Potty training a 10 year old has been much easier than it previously would have been. But um, for us, that that's really huge. And so I'm so glad to hear that. And I know that many other families um, will be happy to hear about that too. Can you speak to that bill's progress at the leg legislation this year? Sure, and I, I would in, uh, encourage uh, everyone in your community to really get behind and try and be supportive of this. So I wish I could say this was my idea, but as with so many things, uh, I had a constituent that lives uh, in my Senate district who reached out to me and uh, pointed me towards Arizona, which has been doing some of this kind of work ahead of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, as a physical therapist, I, I'm aware of this, but it just hadn't struck me as how impactful it is for people um, who have individuals that require, uh, adult individuals particularly, mm -hmm. uh, who require a lot of assistance in the restrooms. Um, and so obviously we've had the changing tables for uh, babies and infants for a number of, of years. Uh, as part of our adapting society, it simply makes sense um, as we, uh, as people are integrated into the normal uh, daily activities of life, as you um, uh, and your family experience the normal activities of life that everyone ought to be entitled to. Uh, these are the kind of challenges that we have to address. Um, this is the first year that the bill has been introduced. Um, passage will be difficult, quite honestly. Uh, you're going to have a lot of people who are going to want to contemplate the cost of it, what, mm -hmm. uh, 
the impact on uh, small businesses, the impact on large businesses, the impact on government. Um, so this is our first crack at this. I told you earlier, I've been working on balanced billing for eight years. It's not unusual to have to work on legislation for a while. This one makes sense to people. And I think again, if the communities will reach out and create a groundswell of public support, then the legislative support comes along uh, uh, with it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, I, you you answered all my questions and I really am so glad to hear about that. And I know that there are many families that are glad to and, and proud of the work that you've done for eight years because I mean, that that's a long time and, and it takes time to, uh, to make things move and especially move the needle. So thank you for all the work that you're doing for our community and, um, and for our state. I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. And, and it's a, it's a truly an honor. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate, um, Senator, for being here. I, it's the end of the week for you. I know you're headed home, but it's just really great to have you and to be um, able to thank you for the important work that you do. So thank you very much. You're we're gonna, we're going to move on. I'm going to introduce you very quickly, everyone, to Jeff Strand. Um, Jeff is our coordinator for um, governmental and external affairs here at the coalition. And he's going to talk a little bit about what is happening um, in terms of legislation, legislative session um, as we wait for Senator Akbari to join us. Jeff. Thank you, Carol. Uh, and thanks everybody for having me. I'm super excited to talk about uh, the Disability Coalition's uh, uh, public policy priorities this year. Uh, we gather our public policy priorities uh, from our membership. Uh, we ask in the fall uh, what types of policies our groups are interested in pursuing, and then we take a look at how we can make those happen. So there are quite a few bills that we are very interested in this year. Uh, probably at the top of that list is uh, HB 1062 SB 1349. That is a bill uh, being carried by Senator Gardenhire and Representative Hawk that redefines the um, definition of intellectual disability in the Tennessee Code when it comes to the death penalty. There's a couple bills out there that look like this, but this is one that we're really focusing on. We think it's really important, uh, not only for our state to conform to Supreme Court rules and the Tennessee Supreme Court rules, but to ensure that we are not uh, executing people who have intellectual disabilities. That's you know against federal law. Uh, and what really needs to happen is to fix our code so that it aligns with federal law. So that's one we're really looking forward at um, and we're working hard on. It is in the House Criminal Justice Subcommittee on March 17th. Uh, so if you're interested, um, you can follow along on the weekly policy updates and I'll have a link so you can watch that. Another one um, <clears throat> that we're following uh, from one of our member organizations, it's led by uh, Molly Anderson from the ARC, is the uh, Tech to 911 service. Um, that is HB 0173 SB uh, 0182. And that's pretty much what it sounds like. It asks the state to set up uh, a system of text to 911 supports uh, available to anybody in the case of an emergency. We think that one's an important one, not just for folks who um, might have some uh, speech impediments or speech um, disabilities, but also uh, for anybody who can't uh, talk in the middle of an emergency uh, where text would be more appropriate for the type of emergency that they're in. So we're following that one closely. That's being carried by um, Senator Massey and Representative Manis. Uh, and that's assigned a committee, but it's not yet on calendars. We also have uh, the Teachers Discipline Act. And that's one that has moved super duper fast. Um, that got going right off the bat uh, in both the House and Senate. And this morning, it was heard on the Senate floor after passing the House earlier this week. So it is about one step away from becoming a law. Um, it's one we're very concerned about. It gives uh, teachers or it, it asks LEAs or, or districts to create uh, behavior and discipline policies that allow teachers to repeatedly and quickly remove a student from their classroom, potentially permanently. Uh, and we have a lot of concerns about what that means, especially as kids return to school after, you know, perhaps a year away. Um, it allows for teachers to uh, make the subjective choice that something is disruptive or defiant and to remove that student. And we really think that that's the wrong approach to this. Uh, we understand that teaching is a difficult job. 
and that there are students who do have behavioral difficulties, but students are best served in their classrooms where they can grow academically and behaviorally. So that one is very close to becoming law. Um, we're still concerned about it. Keep an eye on that one. Uh, another one we're taking a look at is uh, $15 DSP wages for direct service providers. Um, as you might have heard recently over the past couple of years, the legislature has uh, slowly and incrementally uh, raised the wages for DSPs. Um, it's up in the $10-ish average range, which still puts us pretty well below the national average. Uh, this bill would raise the DSP wage to $15 over the next three years. Um, it is currently being carried um, by Senator Gardenhire and Representative Hazelwood. It has been referred to committee, but it's not on calendar yet. We think this is an important one, if not a heavy lift. Um, the legislature has shown their willingness to support DSPs and get them a living wage uh, so that we can kind of reduce this turnover that we have among DSPs and to ensure that we have enough DSPs um, to go around in our state to support students, uh, individuals with disabilities. Um, so that one is moving, but it's moving slowly. So something to keep an eye on. Step therapy, step, excuse me, step therapy reform. That is uh, HB 0677 and SB 1310. Um, that's being carried by Senator Hensley and Representative Hall. Likewise, that's been referred to committee, but it's not on the calendar yet. Um, it creates new guidelines um, that limit the use of step therapies for prescription drugs in some cases and provide spe uh, specified exemptions. Um, excuse me. Um, we think that's an important one as well because step therapy can be really problematic for individuals with disability, particularly those um, who need prescription drugs. And while this doesn't outlaw uh, the practice altogether, it puts some guidelines uh, on providers, uh, health providers, insurance providers that limit options for people with disabilities. Um, so we're following that one closely and we're encouraging its, um, its movement in Congress. Thank you, Jeff. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll get, you, get you back up here if we've got in a minute, but, but, but right now, uh, Representative Clay Doggett has joined us. And so we'd like to go ahead and do that. Um, unfortunately, um, Senator Akbari um, has not joined the, the, our webinar today. Uh, we've made a call into her office. We'll see how we do. But we are delighted um, that Representative um, Doggett has able to join us today. And um, we have with us one of his constituents who is um, Chrissy Hood and uh, Jeff Strand, who you just heard from, will also um, be a part of this part of the panel. So uh, thank you, Representative, for being here. Really appreciate it. Well, good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Representative. Um, Representative Doggett uh, represents Giles County and part of Lawrence County. He is chair of the House Criminal Justice Subcommittee and also sits on the Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee, the Criminal Justice Full Committee, and the Naming and Designation Committee. So thank you for joining us, Representative Doggett. Um, I'd also like to introduce Chrissy Hood. Uh, Chrissy lives in Representative Doggett's district. She is mom to Elena, who has multiple disabilities and numerous medical conditions. She is a governor appointed council member for the Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities, co-chapter lead of Changing Spaces Tennessee, and the founder and chair of Connecting the Journey Special Needs Support Group. Thank you for joining us, Chrissy. Thank you. Representative Doggett, thank you for being here today. Um, you and I met last year at um, Disability Day on the Hill. This was um, a time, my first Disability Day on the Hill last year. My husband and uh, my daughter Elena were there and we met to, to talk with you about the need for height adjustable adult size changing tables, something that you personally had never really thought of, but it wasn't something you didn't care about. You listened to our, our needs, you listened to our concerns. And um, from that, we have um, House Bill 905. And I want to thank you um, for being the sponsor of that. So today I would like to ask, can you share a little bit about your goals for this bill? Well, absolutely. And thank you so much uh, for having me as a part of this uh, webinar. Um, you know, when we first met last year on this, uh, and like you said, it was something that I had not uh, really ever thought about um, having a, a need. And after our conversations that day and speaking with other colleagues and even speaking to people in the community in which we live, 
uh, most certainly there's a need there. Uh, my wife works in healthcare, and, and when I mentioned it to her that evening, she said, well, absolutely, that's a that's really a no-brainer. And so uh, was very glad that we had some good legislation this year that we could bring to help uh, promote this and and hopefully get this uh, across the finish line. Uh, you and I had spoken uh, about specifically our, our Cordell Hall building where our offices are housed and uh, about having a, a, an adult changing table there. I spoke with our speaker, Cameron Sexton, very favorable uh, conversation. And uh, we are still in the process of working through that to see about getting one put on our first floor where our committee rooms are. Uh, so that we can have one there uh, whenever we have visitors that come that may have the need, uh, it'll be accessible to them. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that and uh, also looking forward to carrying this legislation across the finish line. What are the next steps for this bill? Well, we've got, uh, I haven't checked the status of the bill in the Senate side. Uh, yet uh, we are hoping to start moving this through the committee process and so it will go through about uh, I would think there's uh, about five committees that we're looking at having to go through and once we get through those committees uh, it'll be on the house floor uh, the senate has a little bit uh, shorter committee process they're looking at about three committees before it goes to the floor so it'll end up once it starts moving there it'll end up on their on their side on their floor pretty quick and then, um, and then we should be soon uh, to follow them right, right behind them. And uh, so we're, we're looking at, you know, uh, probably six to eight weeks before okay. we know if it's passed. All right. And can you share how the disability community might support the passage of this bill? Well, sure, because it's going to give opportunities for uh, citizens that, that have a need to be able to go when when they go out in public and, and it's not going to be for every public building but for those that uh very specifically tailored to in in the legislation but uh at larger venues uh they'll have opportunities to uh utilize these tables uh not only for those with disabilities but uh for families that may have uh you know infant children that that are needed we often see the changing tables for infants and restrooms and and these tables could also double as that uh, i really think that this is something statewide even nationwide really that should be looked at instead of using uh the infant tables in a lot of restrooms they could very well easily put these uh adult style changing tables in that would fit everyone uh from birth uh through uh, elderly age that it would be beneficial to have in these restrooms and so I'm, uh, I think that it's going to be a, a, a very good uh, deal for, for all and have received a lot of calls and emails in support of this from uh, people from all walks of life, not only from our community, but across the state that are very excited to see that we're taking this step. And so uh, fingers crossed, everything is going to work out fine and we'll, we'll get this passed. Thank you so much for answering those questions and for your support and truly seeing the need that families like ours have for the height adjustable adult size changing tables. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. I know that you are the, um, the chair of the criminal justice subcommittee. Can you share about the uh, committee's priorities? Well, we, uh, we don't necessarily have a set of priorities as a committee as a whole. What we do is we look at the legislation that each member has filed uh, for this year that uh, deals with any type of criminal justice issues, criminal issues, uh, reform. And so we have a lot of legislation that's coming through. And so we have everything from uh, looking at sentencing reform to uh, dealing with uh, you know, surveillance cameras and drone usage uh, by law enforcement. We look at issues within the prisons. And so it's really a, a buffet of ideas that come before us. And so each week there is a different, uh, it's, it's a whole different spread that you have as it comes through. And our, and our objective, the, our, our task that we have is to 
make sure that good legislation uh, moves on to the next full committee for more vetting. Uh, we have uh, nine members on our subcommittee and then the full committee has more members. And so you wanna make sure that, uh, you know, if there is legislation out there that is beneficial to Tennesseans, that there's an opportunity for it to be further vetted by more members of a larger committee. Okay, and are there any bills that would benefit Tennesseans with disabilities specifically? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a few. Uh, we've had a couple that looked at, and there's one that's, uh, well, there's actually two that'll be up in, in committee this uh, coming week, if we have the opportunity to hear them uh, because of time constraints, that uh, look, with, uh, look at the death penalty uh, for those that have an intellectual disability uh, that they would, uh, right now, the way the current code is, is written, it, it looks at the IQ instead of uh, a much uh, greater and well-defined uh, spectrum that is used currently in other places of our, uh, the Tennessee code. And so that's, that's one idea. There's also another bill that uh, addresses the same issue, but has a different um, definition for, um, for looking at that. And so we will, our committee will have the opportunity to hear both of those bills this next week. All right, thank you. I appreciate your time. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. Glad to be with you all. Muting, always a bad thing. So I was just saying thank you, Representative Dongan, for being with us today. We really appreciate the work you do and taking some time out of your Thursday afternoon. I know that um, it's a time to get back to your home. And so thank you for being with us. I really appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, we will continue to move on with our virtual town hall. Really uh, pleased to be there. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you uh, can come back on for just a jiffy. I noticed that we were showing um, your slide a few minutes ago of uh, priority bills, and maybe we can um, get that back up, Sarah, if you're able to do that. Um, I, we've, we've got, a, it takes a whole village here to do the thing. Yeah, so I don't know that you were able to finish up, Jeff, on some of the things that um, we've been taking a look at. Yeah, uh, like I said before, uh, we've got a, a big list and this is just a partial list right here. Um, but these are ones that we um, think have some legs and think would uh, be worth following for anybody who's interested in uh, disability political issues. Um, I believe I left off right after step therapy reform. Um, next up on my list here is uh, HB 1348 and SB 1205. That's 340B discrimination prohibition. Uh, so there are, there are a few there. I think there are four or five um, pharmacy benefit reform bills uh, moving through right now. Uh, we think this one is very interesting. It is very simple, which we think will help it move through more quickly. Um, it uh, prohibits um, 340B entities for pharmacy dispensing drugs uh, from reimbursing at a rate lower than the rate paid of the same drug elsewhere. Um, so it removes the... Um, the motivation for pharmacy benefit managers or anybody who is that, um, that middle person when it comes to helping set these prices, it removes the incentive for them to push more expensive drugs uh, for more expensive reimbursement. Uh, and it's got um, an, an enforcement mechanism. So that's one of the more important things about this bill specifically. Not all the pharmacy benefit, manage, um, or pharmacy benefit reform bills have that enforcement mechanism. So that's why we really like this one. So, it's, um, so pharmacy is kind of a complicated issue, uh, but this really does, is going to help folks with lower incomes, right? I mean, the, I think the 340B program is one that some of the um, charitable clinics use, for example, in order to provide um, medications for folks who need them, including folks with disabilities. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and because or like most of you have not seen me before at a Disability Day on the Hill, this is my first one. So I'm still relatively new. So uh, getting into the uh, pharmacy and Medicaid world, I'm still learning, I'm still learning. So I appreciate everybody learning here with me. Um, next up on the list is a Health Benefit Plan Network Access and Adequacy Act. It's a mouthful, but it's also a very nice bill. Um, it sets uh, minimum standards for insurance providers and healthcare providers uh, for their health plan networks 
uh, that are considered in network and out of network. Um, this is another one that's a little bit uh, complicated because it, it dives into the insurance world, but I'm sure everybody here knows that their insurance plans have in network and out of network um, uh, providers. Uh, the in network ones are significantly less expensive. The out network ones are much more expensive. This one uh, ensures that the in networks uh, provided by, or in network, in network health providers uh, provided by insurance companies uh, are adequate um, in time and distance from where people live who own those health insurance policies. Um, it ensures that there are certain specialty um, healthcare providers within 30 minutes or 30 miles of uh, given spaces. Um, it uh, requires that um, healthcare providers provide a list of these in-network, out-of-network and establish why they their network is adequate. And it's got, like the previous one, an enforcement mechanism. Um, the state legislature has to sign off on all of the uh, healthcare contracts uh, between healthcare providers and insurance providers uh, to ensure that the network is adequate. Great. Okay, Jeff, thank you. Senator Gardenhire has joined us, so I'm gonna cut you off again, which is the sort of thing I do, it turns out. Um, we are very pleased to have um, Senator Gardenhire join us for our town hall this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna hand it back off to Sarah Scott, who lives in um, Senator Gardenhire's area, and um, one of his constituents, um, Dominique Pruitt, who's gonna join us um, as well. Thank you, Sarah. Senator Garden Hire represents District 10, which encompasses Bradley County and part of Hamilton County. He is the first vice chair of the state and local government committee and the chair of the joint fiscal review committee. He also sits on the finance ways and means committee and the judiciary committee. Dominique is a single mother of three children with, aut with autism. Um, she is an excellent self-advocate and advocate for her children. And she recently started a, a family group for uh, black families in her community with autism. We're happy to have you both with us today. So it's nice uh, Senator, being you're part on of you. This. Senator, you're on mute, if you can unmute. You'd be, that'd be great, thank you. There we go. Did I do it? Did I unmute it? You did. Okay, yeah, I apologize. I'm, I'm driving and I'm trying to get to a pull off place, uh, but I can't, I can't look at the screen and all you can see is my inner ear probably as I hold the <laughs> phone up, I apologize. But, we uh, understand. Yeah, but it's good good to be on the call, and uh, I'm coming to a pull off here in just a minute. But uh, what what else can I do for you, uh, Dominique? Hello. Yes. Oh. Okay. So, how how Tennessee defines an intellectual disability matters, Tennessee. Can hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, I, I was just making sure. Um, how Tennessee defines an intellectual disability matters. Tennessee current law defining and diagnosing intellectual disability in the courts and capital cases is out of date. Can you describe SB 1349 and how, how would it change this?
So I'll just jump in for a minute while the senator tries to find a, par a, a parking spot, apparently, or, or Sarah, perhaps you would like to and just talk a little bit about um, our interest in this and, and the senator's sponsorship of this bill. Uh, I didn't know she was asking me a question. I'm sorry. It, it's, okay, it's okay, Senator. So um, Dominique's question was about um, defining intellectual disability and modernizing um, the code, the, the criminal code um, in yeah. your bill SB 1349. Um, and just wanted you to speak to that for a minute. Yeah, what, what, we're, what we're trying to do is in the code, it just says somebody has intellectual disability to have an IQ of 70 or less. And, and that's, that's an out, way out of dated uh, uh, definition. And uh, we're, we're working to get it redefined to a more modern day version of, of what that would be. Uh, and, and right now we, we had it, I had it introduced in the Senate last week, but there was some discrepancies in the code number that we opened up. And so as soon as we get that cleared up this weekend, we'll reintroduce it next uh, Tuesday. Uh, no, Wednesday, next Wednesday in the, in the health department and uh, the health committee in the Senate and then move forward with it. But it's, it's pretty, pretty, has a lot of ramifications and it's, they're all good ramifications on trying to redefine that uh, definition. Great. Dominique? When this bill comes up in the committee, how how can we as a com uh, community member support it? Well, if if you contact your senator or house representative when it comes up in the house, uh, make it a personal email, make it short. Uh, be sure to uh, give your full contact information, not just an email address, because we like to know who we're talking to or communicating with. And uh, uh, just ask them to, uh, to support it and, and maybe tell a little bit about your personal story without getting real long with it. We're in the session right now, we're getting three to 400 emails a day. And so we just can't go through and read all of them. Uh, but just contact them. Don't make it real long. Uh, just let them know you're in support of it. I believe it's gonna, not going to have any problem. I, I didn't, I didn't run into any problems when I was presenting it, except for the code number. And that was, that's a technicality that we'll correct next week, but I don't think there'll be any problems. I hope not, uh, at least not in the Senate, uh, but, but we'll, uh, we'll see. So just, just contact your own local state representative or state Senator is the best thing to do. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Um, the disability community is affected every day by the short supply of direct support professional. We depend on them to live independently and to work in the community. This is a statewide crisis. How would your bill to increase pay for DSPs address this? Uh, uh, well, the, the bill that I introduced to, to give uh, better pay for the people working in those uh, facilities, uh, it probably will not pass this year, but I think we'll be able to get some of it uh, in, a, in, a, in a shape of a, of a bonus and a shape of, uh, of uh, an increase in uh, salaries that we're after. I, I made it fairly aggressive when I introduced that bill and uh, I did that on purpose. I knew we would not be able to afford, I'll give you an example. If, if we bump up the hourly pay from where it is now to $15 an hour, uh, that's in, in the year, I think it's five or six, and I'd have to look at my spreadsheet to see, and I don't have it in front of me. It's $280 million that it, that it accumulates in those five or six years cost the state. Uh, and, and, and that's a recurring expense. We have a lot of non-recurring money coming in from the federal government. But what I'm trying to do is, is do the increase on the recurring side uh, so people can, can have a better uh, 
income for the work that they do. I, uh, I, I've seen the work that they do, and it's just a hard job. Yes, I agree with you. Um, do you see challenges for this bill ahead? Well, the challenge is, 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 is money down the road, not money this year. Uh, we, we, as, a, as, as an example, uh, as I just said, it's, we're talking about over a five-year, six-year period accumulation of $280 million. And that's not easy to come up with. Uh, but we're going to try to get some of it this year and come back next year and keep coming back until we, till we get that base pay up from where it is now. But the challenge is it's, 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 it's a dollars and cents. Thank you for your honest answer. I have one last question. How can we help? How can you what? How can you help? How can we help support? Well, the, the, the institutions that are, that are in the areas that the states, you know, like for instance, in, in Bradley County, we have Life Bridges and in Chattanooga, we have Orange Grove. Uh, just make sure that the legislators in the areas where we have facilities are contacted to let them know. And in the past, y'all have done a great job in educating us and having us out to the facilities to actually see what's going on. And uh, that's, that's the best way to do it. Uh, but I wouldn't wait too long to start your efforts on that. Thank right, you so good. much. That, that, is, that is really good advice. And thank you, Dominique, for asking those questions. Thank you, Senator, for pulling over and talking to us for a little while. Those are both <laughs> bills that are really important to us and we really appreciate that. Well, it's important. It's important to me too. I, I have a special needs grandson, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, you, you you want everybody to be taken care of. You don't want to push them aside, and and uh, so we we we're we're with you on this. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Dominique. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead and move ahead and let the Senator get back to his driving and get back to his, um, I'm, I'm gonna just come right back to Jeff for just a minute. Um, Jeff, there you are. Thanks, Carol. Uh, I get one more. I wish I could do all the rest of these because they're important for everybody to know about. Um, but next week I will be sending out a, a short summary of all of these bills along with some thoughts about the bill uh, to everybody uh, when, we, when we publish this Zoom video. Uh, so last one I want to talk about is the Disability Child Custody Bill. That's HB 1168 and SB 1388. Uh, that's being carried by Senator Kyle and Representative Harris. Um, that passed through the uh, Child and Family Affairs Subcommittee on Wednesday and has been placed on the Civil Justice Committee uh, for March 17th on the House side. Uh, it hasn't been uh, taken up by committee yet on the, the Senate side. Uh, currently in Tennessee, um, in custody disputes, our code allows for um, someone or a parent's disability to be considered when making a custody determination. Uh, and that to us is just straight up discrimination. Uh, so we're supporting this bill because it changes uh, the code to say that you cannot consider someone's disability uh, when it comes to either parental termination or custody disputes, so long as it doesn't negatively affect a child's uh, well being. Uh, so we think that's a great bill. It's Representative Harris's first bill ever, uh, and he did a great job uh, yes, or yesterday yep, yesterday uh, in the subcommittee talking about it. So um, we're a big fan of this bill, and we, we hope to see it move forward. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So there is a little bit of late breaking news. Senator Akbari, who was going to join us earlier, um, had a press conference run over. She's going to try to hop on in just a minute. But meanwhile, um, we wanted to send you um, Senator, uh, excuse me, Speaker of the House, Cameron Sexton, was not able to join us live, but sent us some information um, to share. Um, Cameron is the uh, representative from District 25, in addition to being Speaker of the House, which is um, up in the Upper Cumberland, um, Cumberland, Van Buren, and Putnam counties, um, and obviously has committee memberships anywhere he wants them since he's the Speaker, but he, of course he does calendar and rules. So um, Sarah, if you could play that video.
Hi, I'm Speaker Cameron Sexton. Thank you for allowing me to join you today in this virtual town hall with the Tennessee Disability Coalition. I just want to apologize to you that we can't do this in person with a day on the hill. Hopefully next year when things calm down in the pandemic and more vaccinations are available with people, we'll have the opportunity to meet again. But I want to thank you with all my heart and all the members too, who you worked with to make sure that Tennessee passed the Katie Beckett waiver. We just got federal approval last November. The program's being implemented and is due to the work of the coalition and all of you in making sure that Tennessee was able to have that waiver. And so we're expecting great things and a lot of help with the 10 care program using Katie Beckett. But as we move forward, we still have much to do, whether it's focusing on behavioral health, focusing more on telehealth, but doing what we can to make sure that in school and out of school, they can be able to seek the health care that they need and the resources that they need. So once again, I look forward to seeing you soon. We will always have an open door for you. If you ever need anything, please feel free to reach out to us. Once again, hope to see you next year. Sorry we're having to do this virtual, but I will see you soon. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah, for playing that for us. Um, and we we are we're, we're also sorry that we aren't able to see the speaker of the house in person, but um, but hopefully next year we'll all be able to be together again. Get your vaccination, everyone. That that's it. Um, we're we're going to give Senator Akbari just a couple of more minutes, but meanwhile, there's a couple things I want to just talk to you about. Um, and the most important one is just coming up now, which is that Tennessee's lighting up blue for Disability Advocacy Day, um, March 11th. You know, you heard. Um, uh, Representative Whitson and Jernigan talk about the proclamation about Disability Advocacy Day. And in honor of that day, the state cupola, the top of, on top of the state capitol, and over 20 landmarks across the state of Tennessee are going to be lighting up coalition blue, as we call it. Um, that is going to include um, the Bass Pro Pyramid in Memphis, for those of you in West, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, you know, we've got all the best landmarks, don't we? The Dollywood War Eagle roller coaster at Pigeon Forge. And UT's Neyland Stadium, for example, are all going to light up blue today um, to support the Disability Advocacy Day as an individual or an organization. There is a digital library of graphics, social media messaging, hashtags, um, and other resources that are available on the coalition's website. We hope that we'll use some of those. Our background today, which is always a little bit ghosty, but kind of funny, is one that um, uh, is, is also available. So I think that that's really great. Um, I see that Senator Akbari has joined us. Terrific. Um, so with that, I am going to introduce to you um, Senator Akbari, uh, my colleague Donna DiStefano, um, who uh, will introduce the Senator and, and um, also introduce Sandy Klink, who is a constituent of um, Senator Akbari's uh, for, that, for our little discussion. So um, Donna, I'm going to throw it over to you. Thanks, Carol. And thank you, Senator Ackberry. I'm we're really happy that you could join us. We understand, um, you know, last minute things that run over and those kinds of things. So thank you very much. Um, so folks, um, Senator Ramesh Ackberry is from um, the Memphis Shelby County area. She represents District 29, which is part of Shelby County. She's an attorney and uh, she is on the following committees. The, she is the second vice chair for education. She is on commerce and labor and on the ethics committee. So thank you again for being here, um, Senator. I'm gonna introduce Sandy Klink next. Um, Sandy has been a very strong and active advocate for more than more years than she likes to admit. Um, she's been with the Memphis Center for Independent Living for 20 years, and for the last six years, she has been the executive director there. She's a longtime friend of the coalition and currently serves on our board. She is also a former um, Council of Developmental Disability member. She graduated from Partners in Policymaking, and she currently serves as the chair of the Statewide Independent Living Council. So she stays very busy, too. So I will turn it over to um, Sandy. Thank you, Donna. Good to see everybody today. 
Uh, thank you so much, Senator Akbari, for joining us. Uh, you know, centers for independent living across the country work with individuals with disabilities to live their best and independent lives that they want. The motto of independent living is nothing about us without us. So conservatorship and guardian status are kind of last resorts, but are sometimes necessary uh, with small families with uh, individuals with significant disabilities. Uh, can you speak a bit to the goals of SB 1440 and how it will support the individual with disabilities? Alrighty, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so sorry that I was late. Um, hey. things, things do run over, but I know that you all have a, a schedule, so I'm so sorry uh, to be late. And uh, thank you all for doing your, uh, for having your uh, advocacy uh, day or week, really, um, in spite of everything being shut down. I think it's been great to be able to connect with folks um, in a virtual environment. Um, so this piece of legislation was actually brought to me by the clerk's office, um, and I think it just had to do with streamlining some um, notice requirements um, it, as opposed to uh, the current status. So it's not, uh, it's kind of trying to bring things, I think, into the 21st century. It's saying that um, if they cannot get a postal address uh, to, to give notification, uh, then it may be in the newspaper. And if the newspaper does not exist, in that area because some places have, just because of the internet, they might not have a local paper, then it can be posted um, at the courthouse as well. Uh, so from my understanding, it's more procedural. I don't think that um, it will um, it will do anything to, um, to, 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 to make it more difficult or to make it um, easier uh, for someone to, like it's gonna keep things pretty standard, but it has primarily to do with reporting and notice. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. That's that's a good definition for me. Uh, parents and students with disabilities face a lot of challenges and hurdles to receive a free and equal education. Behavioral issues are not reserved for students with an IEP. Response to the uh, Instruction and intervention, RT2, uh, is one option. Can you describe the goals of your legislation and how this bill might change current processes? Um, well, I think our, um, our goal is just to make things uh, more accessible for more people. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with funding around that particular program. Uh, it's been instituted or it, it's, it's one of those unfunded mandates of sorts. Um, so for me, it's all about, mm -hmm. it's all about uh, improving accessibility and resources uh, for those types of interventions, whether or not someone is under an IEP or not. Uh, we do have some concerns about that, but uh, we appreciate oh. you being on top of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure, and if and let me know because certainly don't want to do anything uh, that would um, in any way make things more difficult or or you know uh, be discriminatory in any way. So um, okay. for sure, All right. uh, change, change. I know you're working as the vice chair of the education committee, and you had the opportunity to look at some of the legislation that's intended to improve our education system. Uh, can you identify any of the trends and what you're seeing and how they relate to legislative priorities this year? Uh, well, one I think is literacy. Uh, that seems to be a big, not seems, that has been a big concern since I got to the General Assembly in 2014. Um, statewide testing literacy has always been something that has either declined or stayed the same. It has not improved. Uh, and so I think putting additional resources to provide for literacy coaches and for after school programs or extended summer programs uh, is really going to be important. Not just saying do XYZ, but also providing funding to go along with it. And it's a over $100 million investment. 
Uh, so, so that's something I've noticed. Um, we had the uh, student discipline bill, which I do not, or teacher discipline bill, which I do not agree with for the many reasons I've expressed in committee and on the floor. I think that it uh, potentially can be discriminatory towards the disability community uh, in its implementation. And the sponsor of the bill considered one change, but would not consider the other one. It passed on the Senate floor today. I voted no. Uh, so we'll see what happens with it in the House. Um, I think another big uh, trend is is really trying, and this kind of goes to the governor's investment in broadband, um, is trying to see how we can modernize our school systems uh, because I think the pandemic has kind of highlighted the real lack of technology within the school and also at home. The federal stimulus package two and also package three uh, have provided for an extraordinary amount of money to go to the education system. I think in Shelby County Schools alone in the stimulus package number two, they're gonna get like $200 million. Um, in the third package, they'll get even more. Uh, so it's important that, that these funds are used to make our, and it's very broad how they can use it, right? Like you can't build a new school building, but you can construct or renovate the building to allow more space, which I think can uh, also make the building more accessible. So I think um, hopefully our school systems will get creative and we'll, Obviously, all the plans are due on Monday to the Department of Education for the stimulus package number two. So certainly we'll be looking to see what our various school systems are gonna use that fun those funds for. But I think they have an opportunity to really do some big things uh, with this one-time spending. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, again, I think is around standardized testing. And that was part of the, um, the governor's, um, what was it a uh, special session, uh, whether or not to have a hold harmless year uh, our federal requirements under our ESSA plan, we have to have standardized testing, some sort of accountability testing every year. If we do not want to have it, we have to appeal to the uh, federal government for a waiver. Um, in this case, uh, the only problem with this hold harmless year this year is that 80% of the people who, 80% uh, of students have to be tested. Now in a normal year, it would be 95%. And so we just, I'm concerned based on some things from my school district that if they're not able to test all these students, uh, then will they have will their school scores count for them? And that's not not a good thing. But we'll keep watching that as it's implemented. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And if you're uh, home one time and and want to come by the center and say hi, we'd love to see you. Uh, definitely would love to. Probably once we're done with session, so probably sometime over the summer. But I would love to do that for sure. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both, Sandy and, and Senator Ackberry. Uh, really appreciate uh, your being here. It makes it so much richer to have both of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thanks for juggling around a little bit. Well, that we are we're just slightly over time, and I'm sorry about that, guys. But I think we've had a pretty rich and good session. Um, I do want us to conclude by by my ability to introduce a celebrity musical guest. Um, who is Drew Holcomb. Um, he is one of Americana Music's most popular singers. He is a founding member of the Tennessee-based band Drew Holcomb and the Neighbors. Um, their latest album is Dragons, and the opening song named Family is the soundtrack for our um, Let's Go Further campaign this year. And I hope you saw the video uh, before this session. Drew has a personal connection to disability. His late brother was born with spina bifida. And Drew talks about the richness of his family life growing up experiencing disability um, as a sibling. So we're gonna play this special video message from him and the song that he recorded for us now. Looks like got a little bit of a sound problem. We're going to work on that. Here, I'm a musician and songwriter uh, out of Nashville. I grew up in Memphis and a uh, longtime native Tennessean. So I want to thank the Tennessee Disability Coalition for having me. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit of my story and a song with you guys. So I uh, also am honored that you used our song, Family, as sort of your anthem for your, your 2021 video. Um, my brother was born with spina bifida. Um, he lived... Uh, 14 years and uh, was an incredible kid, 
Uh, I was three years older than him. We just loved uh, my family. We were all very close. And part of the reason we were so close is because of all of the sort of care and attention that he required because of his disability. Um, also know how important it is to have advocates. Um, you know, I remember one trip we went on and the hotel told us that there was no uh, steps anywhere and except where we got there and there was a step out of the hotel room. So we couldn't leave, it was a ski trip. And so just little things in life, I know how difficult they can be and how important it is to have people advocating for a just uh, society for people with, with disabilities. And so um, and these, these issues really Im impact all of us. And so I just wanna thank you all for your advocacy and to say that I'm in your corner. Um, it's important for us all to, to share our stories and to speak up um, on behalf of ourselves if you're if you're a disabled person or on behalf of our, our friends and family who are dealing with different disabilities. So uh, again, honored to be a part of this. So this is a song um, I wrote called uh, called Dragons and um, it's on, sort of a song about overcoming and I want to dedicate it to you guys and the Tennessee Disability Coalition and all the great work that you do. And again, um, very honored to be asked and uh, humbled by your work. I was climbing a mountain, asleep in the moonlight. The ghost of my grandpa came to me in a dream. As a star sung above us, he started singing this chorus. He laughed loud as heaven and said this to me. Take a few chances, a few worthy romances. We're swimming in the ocean on New Year's Day. Don't listen to the critics. Stand up and bear witness. Go slay all the dragons that stand in. Stayed up and talked until the sunrise. War and love and sorrow. He said, Stop spending all your money on forgiveness of sins. Today is all your promise of trouble with tomorrow. Faded into the forest, proudly singing this hymn. Take a few chances. Swimming in the ocean on New Year's Day. Don't listen to the critics. Stand up and bear witness. Go slay all the dragons that stand in your way. Terrific. Good message. I think we all need to go slay a few dragons that stand in our way, don't we? Um, please keep continue to join us. That's about all we have for you here today. I'm sorry we went a little bit long, but I hope that the information was valuable to you. Um, trying to coordinate all those schedules, even DDH, uh, when we're in person can be a little bit challenging. So 
please feel free to text further to 72690 um, to kind of get in the loop on things that are happening. We'll be texting messages back and, and helping you understand what's going on. Uh, make those appointments if you haven't already. Fill, fulfill those appointments with legislators if you can. And um, always be in touch. We're grateful to everyone. It does take us all working together to go further to make Tennessee a great place for people with disabilities. Thanks for being here today.